Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Today, joining me is Stephen Roach. He is a senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs and a senior lecturer at Yale School of Management. He was formerly chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia and the firm's chief economist for the bulk of his 30 year career at Morgan Stanley, heading up a highly regarded team of economists around the world. Uh, Professor Roche, thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure to be with you, Tiger. You, you run a great program. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, well, I couldn't do it alone and uh, co-hosting the show with me is, is my longtime uh, friend, Sam Lee. Yeah, thanks, Sam, how are you? <laughs> thanks, and thanks for being on the show, Professor Roche. Looking forward to it. Uh, Professor Roach, maybe we should jump right in because uh, the reason I reached out to you is because I read your October 5th, 2020 column on the Financial Times titled The End of the Dollar's Exorbitant Privilege. And by the time I read that, I was uh, somewhat uh, fascinated by this idea that there would be somewhat of a dollar crash. And you later said it could be as big as a 35% drop uh, in, in dollar. Um, so I decided to reach out to you and that's how this interview uh, came to happen. And while it, it took us a couple months, now is we're recording this on February the 10th. So a few months have, have lapsed and so much other stuff has happened in the financial markets, but perhaps we can start the interview with that event. What, why did you say that the dollar was soon sort of crash falling down? Well, um, Tiger, first of all, it's a pleasure to be on your program. Um, and uh, for such a uh, a young man and even a guy from Princeton, you've really put together um, an outstanding format and you've interviewed some very uh, uh, notable and accomplished uh, academics and, and the policymakers. Um, I'm just a big believer that uh, when uh, unusual things happen, and we're clearly in the midst of a very unusual period with the biggest um, uh, recession uh, in, uh, in modern history, the most aggressive monetary and fiscal uh, policy support that we've ever seen. Um, when developments like that go to um, extremes, that there will be unexpected consequences. And so I, you know, have a sort of a, uh, you know, a Newtonian view of uh, the, the market consequences. And I think long and hard about what might shift in response to those uh, developments. And so I came up with the dollar because I have long been mindful of the fact that the United States, you know, despite all of its strengths as an economy uh, over many, many decades, uh, has an extremely low uh, domestic savings capacity. And I'm a big believer that over the long haul, countries need saving to support uh, economic uh, growth uh, through investment in uh, capacity, infrastructure, human capital, R&D, and the like. And lacking in domestic savings and wanting to grow, we end up uh, borrowing surplus savings from abroad and running big current account and trade deficits to attract the foreign capital. And so what I saw coming out of this period was uh, a US economy entering uh, the COVID uh, shock with a historically low savings rate that was going to get um, stressed as never before. Uh, and with that low savings rate undergoing uh, stress, uh, I did see a sharp further deterioration in our seemingly chronic current account deficit uh, that could potentially have consequences for um, uh, the dollar. When countries are faced with current account deficits, uh, the deficit um, uh, correction mechanism, if you want to call it that, falls on sort of two levers, either the currency or short-term interest rates. And that was sort of the, uh, you know, the nail in the coffin for me, because the Fed has made it very clear that the last thing they're going to do would be to raise interest rates uh, to counter anything. 
including uh, a, um, uh, a sharp widening of the current account. So with the Fed's um, main policy arm tied behind its back, my conclusion was that this was a, um, uh, a warning sign of a very sharp plunge to come uh, in the dollar. The dollar's fallen since I first wrote my negative uh, dollar piece um, last June, maybe about 12%. So, you know, using baseball, uh, we're in sort of the third inning uh, of a nine inning game. We've got more to come. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so kind of, you know, what your theory is, is that there are two factors that are these kind of primary drivers of the dollar's decline. That's the decrease in domestic savings as, and the increase in the current account deficit. So I guess my, my question would be, what exactly is the mechanism that comes from these two factors? You know, what is it that causes the dollar's decline ultimately? Well, Sam, I mean, these are sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call the current account and uh, the saving two different factors. Um, when countries um, run low savings rates, and they still uh, want to invest and, and grow. And, you know, economics has lots of crazy theories, but the, usually the identities uh, are more powerful than the theories. And, and one of the first identities uh, that I hope you guys at Princeton were taught in your intro uh, econ classes uh, is that savings must always equal investment. And so when savings goes, domestic savings goes down and you still want to maintain the investment uh, that is required for economic growth, the only way to square the circle is to borrow surplus savings from abroad. And when you do that, uh, the only way to attract uh, that surplus savings or the foreign capital from abroad is to run a deficit in your balance of payments. And so the uh, the balance of payments deficit uh, gets wider and wider uh, the more that we need to attract uh, surplus savings from abroad. So, you know, put some numbers around it. Um, you know, we've been running an exceedingly low uh, dom domestic savings rate in net terms. And I use the net domestic savings rate, um, which includes not just the savings of uh, individuals, uh, but the savings of, um, of uh, businesses uh, and the government sector alike. Um, you know, the savings rate was, the net savings rate uh, was running about 2% before the COVID shock. Uh, and now it's negative to the tune of about um, uh, 1% uh, at, at the end of, uh, uh, 2020. Uh, and so to go from, you know, plus two to minus one, that's an unusually sharp swing. And it's just the beginning because the main factor driving the domestic savings rate down uh, are these massive COVID related expansions uh, in our budget deficit. Uh, and so um, uh, again, part of my view on the dollar is that deficits have consequences. People focus, I think, incorrectly uh, on the wrong consequence. Uh, a lot of people right now are saying, well, we have this brilliant new theory called modern monetary theory. I know you guys have talked about this, I think, with Bill Dudley, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes. <laughs> I sort of subscribe to the same uh, response that he does. It's neither modern nor a theory. But um, it, the, the reason budget deficits don't have uh, uh, consequences for uh, sovereign debt is because uh, interest rates are low and that's a reflection of low inflation. But that doesn't mean they don't have consequences. And so when the deficit goes uh, uh, into steep uh, uh, negative territory, as it's doing right now and will continue, uh, uh, under the assumption that uh, the Biden um, uh, plan uh, is enacted, uh, then that will push our 
negative savings rate from say a minus uh, one today to uh, you know minus five, maybe minus six percent, and the the current account, uh, which is now you know a negative um, three and a half, could go to you know four and a half five percent. When I first wrote about it, I said it would break a new record of uh, six and a half. It maybe it doesn't get that far, but it it gets into steep negative territory with consequences for the dollar. Uh, Professor Roach, you uh, brought up modern monetary theory. I didn't know we would so quickly jump into that that concept, and we certainly don't have to sort of go go into the details of it. Uh, but the modern monetary theory proponents obviously feel like we we don't have to worry so much about the deficit, and proponents of it, or at least um, uh, proponents would, would would say at least right now we are in the middle of a recession, and in the middle of a recession you shouldn't worry too much about it. And then there are the people who I, I remember reading a paper I think by uh, Jason Furman and Larry Summers published in uh, the Peterson Institute I think last December t titled uh, "Reconsideration of Fiscal Policy in the Era of Low Interest Rates," and they were kind of saying obviously the low interest rate environment create numerous opportunities. That this kind of expand the scope for expansionary fiscal policy. They make the debt more sustainable. Uh, they increase the scope of public investments that will pay for themselves uh, over time. So in, in many ways, uh, for an average American, as you said, they, they don't feel any tangible impact of this blowing up of deficit. They're saying that the tide is turning. Um, people are just not realizing it. And in, in this era of low interest rate that we seem to be unable to get out of, uh, we should at least worry uh, about getting us out of the recession and then um, not worry about the, the, the deficit for now. Um, well, Tiger, look, I, I love your imagery of the tide is turning because <laughs> just remember, you know, uh, you know, there's a high tide and there's a low tide. Uh, and as long as the moon keeps circling uh, the earth, uh, the tide will come in and the tide will go out. So, um, you know, for the time being, uh, uh, interest rates, short-term rates are basically at zero. Long-term rates are not a whole lot higher. And so the consequences of taking on more debt uh, for, um, you know, individuals, businesses, and our government, even, you know, in doing these massive COVID relief bills, uh, the immediate consequences are not uh, severe. And I think that's pretty much the case that, um, Jason and, and Larry made uh, in their serious reassessment uh, of um, uh, sort of fiscal policy strategy in a low interest rate environment, as opposed to the non-serious gobbledygook you get from reading, you know, the books on uh, modern monetary theory, uh, <laughs> which, um, are you going to cut me on that one? Oh, there it is. Yeah. The, 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 I'm, not, I'm not showing it because of the background. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Myth. <laughs> and that's what I mean. You know, I, I, those, you know, those, those, those are right out of the same ilk that gave us, you know, voodoo economics and all these, uh, you know, free lunches uh, that were um, promised by uh, supply side economics that would uh, make deficits miraculously disappear when, when they didn't. But, you know, I take the point that, you know, economies in recession you, do, you know, you, you want to be aggressive uh, in providing stimulus. There's no question about it. But that doesn't mean there aren't consequences of those actions. That's the point that I'm trying to make. And so you don't get away with providing uh, stimulus uh, and claiming that there are no consequences when measured through debt service or interest rates. And don't confuse uh, those outcomes in terms of debt service, uh, uh, low debt service, uh, and low interest rates, uh, with a discovery of an amazing new theory that can explain why deficits will never matter again. Those are a, both a direct outgrowth of an extraordinary compression uh, in inflation. Uh, and it may well be that you know inflation stays uh, low forever, uh, and that you know we can certainly entertain uh, open-ended budget deficits as a consequence uh, forever. I would point out, though, with great irony, that none other than Larry Summers uh, has recently caused a lot of controversy uh, in worrying about the inflationary consequences uh, of the Biden uh, COVID relief package. 
So even a guy like Larry, who's leading the charge uh, in fighting secular stagnation uh, with uh, large bu budget deficits, uh, is starting to think about the consequences uh, of those um, uh, actions. And that's what my dollar call is. I have a different set of consequences than he do, but he does, but we're both uh, sort of looking at the same reaction, counter-reaction uh, construct. Right, so then what exactly could you know, the Fed or the Treasury do to prevent that dollar crash, to prevent you know, these massive declines that you projected? Not much, uh, really. Uh, I mean, you know, the Fed could always change policy um, and uh, tighten interest rates, and that would certainly send the dollar sharply higher. But they, they've made it really clear, Sam, that that's the last thing they're going to do in this climate. And, um, you know, not only are they mindful of, um, of, of tightening uh, policy uh, in, you know, in the depths of a lingering severe uh, recession and crisis, but they've come up with a whole new structure to uh, formulate their strategy of, of average inflation targeting, which is designed to compensate for uh, the unexpected shortfalls of inflation relative to their 2% price stability target that have been building up over a year. So if anything, they'll stay easier for longer than they otherwise might have been. And again, that has consequences for the dollar. Uh, Professor Roach, I would love to uh, dig in a little bit more about the, this concept of the dollar crash before we go into talk about other uh, large macro financial trends. But it's, it seems to me, first of all, when I re read your do uh, dollar crash piece uh, for the first time, I was very skeptical because I, there are so many advantages and privileges of dollar. You use the phrase exorbitant advantage, uh, a privilege. I mean, dollar has so much incumbent advantage. Uh, there's not really a good alternative. It seems that you know the dollar dominance might be waning slowly, but it's still the reserve currency for a very long time because it doesn't seem to have an immediate alternative out there. Uh, you know, euro is kind of a derivative of the dollar, whereas you know China has its own uh, you know domestic political uh, political economy issues that will prevent it from becoming a global reserve currency. And, and other uh, political theorists, uh, even recently on our show, have talked about the convertibility, uh, the the flexibility. Of of dollar, which is that, um, you know, uh, at, when, when crisis hit, when COVID-19 hit, people looked for immediately converting whatever assets they had into dollar because they felt that that is uh, the most kind of secure form or liquid form of uh, asset they could have. And at the end of the day, the nominal value of dollar will at least be preserved because the, the Federal Reserve, because the U.S. government are there. So it seems that there's a long list of advantages that the dollar have. And even though we could see some kind of correction of dollar valuation, uh, it is still the currency, right? Well, it is till it isn't, Tiger. I mean, um, <laughs> so um, first of all, just to, to correct you, I mean, uh, the, you know, the title of my piece, uh, you know, the, the days of the exor exorbitant privilege are over the, I, I wish I had coined that, but that goes back to Valerie Giscard d'Estaing yes. at the time, a former finance minister, then on to be president of, of France. And he said it out of frustration, like, you know, he, yes. he looked uh, sort of with scorn uh, at um, many of the things that were occurring in the United States, uh, you know, in the 70s and, and uh, 80s. Uh, and yet, you know, he just bemoaned the fact that, you know, despite uh, his criticism of some of uh, our more uh, unfortunate habits, that the dollar still maintained its dominance as the, the world's uh, reserve currency. So he called it this, you know, uh, you know, sort of unqualified or exorbitant uh, privilege. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a 35 percent drop. That doesn't mean that the, the dollar is going to lose its dominance uh, as the world's reserve currency just by this short, relatively short-term uh, correction. The dollar, uh, since the uh, demise of Bretton Woods uh, in the early 70s, uh, the dollar has declined um, three earlier times by an average of about 31% on a broad trade-weighted basis. That happened in the 70s, again in the 80s, 
uh, and again in the early 70s, uh, or early 2000s. And by that, I mean the dollar's uh, real effective exchange rate measured by the, the Bank for International Settlements uh, in Switzerland. Um, so this particular uh, decline is roughly comparable uh, to those uh, three earlier ones. But I would just point out that um, on balance, when the dollar uh, underwent those sharp 30% corrections in those three earlier instances, um, we were saving a lot more as a nation than we are today. Our, again, our net national savings rate was close to 5% on average during those three earlier periods. Today, it's minus one. Um, our current account deficit um, was, our current account was in deficit in those three earlier periods by about two and a half percent. Today, it's, it's a negative three and a half percent. So the economy is um, sort of more poised for a sharp dollar decline today than it was during those three earlier periods of dollar weakness. In terms of the dollar's role as a reserve currency, I mean, um, the dollar accounts for a little less than 60% of total foreign exchange reserves around the world. That's down from 70% around the year 2000, but it's still about triple, you know, the euro, uh, which is a number two. And, the, you know, the renminbi uh, is uh, 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 nowhere. Um, I would take some issue with your characterization of the euro as being sort of a derivative of the dollar. I mean, I think uh, Valerie Giscard d'Estaing, if he was around uh, today, would say that's what I mean by exorbitant privilege. These Americans would say anything about their currency. Um, you know, the euro has um, certainly been uh, uh, weakened uh, significantly uh, by a series of near uh, existential uh, crises that have almost led to the collapse of the European Monetary Union. And if you look at uh, sort of the characteristics of a monetary union, um, you know, historically, and I, I've been very, very critical of uh, the EMU because while it's had a single currency and a single central bank, um, it has not had a unified uh, fiscal policy. And so without the, uh, the integrated pan-European fiscal policy, you know, the, the currency I think was, was, was doomed really uh, from the start. But something happened last July that was really important uh, when European leaders got together, driven by a um, very powerful push by Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron, and um, came to an agreement on what's called the, the next uh, generation uh, EU fund, which is a uh, you know, roughly, a, uh, I think, a 750 billion euro uh, fund complete with sovereign pan-European bond issuing authorities. Some have described, described this as sort of Europe's Hamiltonian moment emblematic of, you know, Alexander Hamilton bringing the, uh, the states together to uh, provide a unified fiscal backstop for uh, the US government. Um, that's probably you know, stretching it a little bit. But all of a sudden you could, you could conjure up a, an image where the fiscal leg of the stool is now in place. And you know, the Euro um, is um, still a, a very weak currency uh, relative to its um, you know, highs of a decade ago, probably the most undervalued major currency uh, in the world. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a good chance that you, you could see the euro uh, begin to strengthen uh, and you know, uh, pick up uh, a fair amount of interest uh, in a weaker dollar climate. And I think the Chinese renminbi, which is a, you know, has a tiny weight uh, in foreign um, 
exchange reserves, uh, it's been rising in, in real effective terms for over a decade. Uh, and uh, you know, China stays the course of opening up and reforming its financial markets, uh, opening its uh, uh, current account. Um, I still think there's plenty of upside uh, for the renminbi. And you know, who knows if this dollar takes off, uh, as I uh, sort of postulated, uh, you will undoubtedly see a flight to um, uh, precious metals and maybe even your favorite alternative asset uh, cryptocurrencies. So then what would, you know, what would the crash of the dollar and potentially the rise of the euro mean for U.S. industry, for Main Street, uh, consumers, or, or really anyone else in the U.S. economy? Well, um, you know, the simple way to put it, Sam, is um, if you're a consumer, you'll start buying fewer goods made um, overseas. Uh, so, you know, you'll cut back on your, I see you're wearing a Louis Vuitton shirt uh, and you have, you're sitting on a sort of a piece of Italian furniture. Uh, <laughs> you know, it'll probably be, um, you know, made in America and it'll be a big break for U.S. companies temporarily for uh, being able to sell American made goods um, uh, at cheaper prices uh, overseas. So, this is what I mean by, you know, the dollar being uh, sort of an adjustment mechanism for a nation with um, a big balance of payments and a, uh, a, a big trade deficit, a weaker currency uh, provides, um, you know, some relief to that. Um, and, and so on a short term basis, I, I think some parts of, of uh, uh, the country uh, might welcome it. It could be very destabilizing. Uh, for financial assets, though, where um, uh, the likelihood of a, a sharp correction in uh, the U.S. currency uh, could come as a rude awakening for many investors who subscribe to your philosophy, Tiger, that, you know, say all you want about the dollar, but, you know, it wouldn't dare fall. Uh, Professor Roach, first of all, you are really exposing Sam here about the Italian furniture and the Louis Vuitton shirt. I mean, Policy Punch has always tried to come off as a grassroots, uh, down-to-earth organization, but but you are you are exposing us. But <laughs> well, I think I think you still have that coursing through your veins. But you know, if, if you want to buy European merchandise, it's going to be um, tougher to do uh, with the greenback going forward. Uh, if I'm correct. So what about the, the argument about uh, dollar st uh, dominance historically intertwined with the geopolitical hegemony of the United States? Uh, so, uh, again, I, I, I'm starting to piece together that we're separating from two issues. One is the decline in value. The other is dollar still being a very dominant currency. So I know you're not arguing that dollar is going to be gone completely, but it, it seems that uh, doesn't the Federal Reserve have all kinds of, um, still have great political power over a lot of the, the developing nations be, because of uh, dollar swap lines or other types of dependence. There are other levers that US, US government can pull to make sure that the dollar doesn't crash. Well, I don't think the, you know, the interconnectedness of financial markets, uh, which is very powerful, and you're entirely right that you know, there are lots of, um, uh, linkages and, and they're larger today than they've ever been um, uh, as central banks have responded to two major crises uh, in the last 12 years by using um, uh, dollar-based liquidity lines to uh, backstop each other uh, during these uh, difficult periods. But, you know, the, the currency is a relative price and notwithstanding um, you know, this um, uh, sort of circulatory uh, system that links uh, global financial markets together, uh, relative prices can rise and fall. The, the point you made on, you know, America's geopolitical role um, uh, and its longstanding sort of hegemonic position, uh, especially in the post-Cold War era, is something we've all actively debated over the last 
four years um, of the Trump administration as we clearly have pulled back on so many uh, aspects of that commitment to global leadership. But you know, now there's a new sheriff in town uh, who is very committed uh, to uh, reestablishing uh, at least our participation in so many of the institutions that we played a leadership role in uh, for, um, uh, for, for generations. So I think, you know, you know talk of um, sort of the end of America's uh, global leadership, uh, you know, did get too extreme during the Trump administration. I certainly uh, was guilty of that uh, myself. Uh, and, and now I think we, we're going to see some, uh, hopefully, um, you know, the pendulum swing back the other way and some correction uh, from those extremes. But it, it's a different world. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it certainly, the, you know, the jury's out on whether or not, you know, it, it will return to, a, you know, a unipolar uh, uh, dominance of one leading nation or, or it'll be a multipolar world with, uh, uh, Europe getting its act together, and you know the uh, the, the Chinese uh, role is one that is openly and actively debated uh, around the world, and that would be viewed, um, you know, in, in some quarters uh, uh, as a real threat. But you know, putting aside uh, you know that uh, aspect of the the rise of China, there's certainly a case to be made for a. Uh, uh, more of a sharing of global power and whether or not that has implications for uh, currencies and financial assets, uh, you know, I think, I think that remains to be seen. We'd love to you know, return to the topic of US-China relations and, and geopolitics maybe later in the interview, but one thing I, I really wanted to ask you about, uh, which you just mentioned was Bitcoin, right? We just saw uh, Elon Musk add $1.5 billion worth of, of Bitcoin to Tesla's balance sheet. Do you think that you, is Bitcoin on the rise? Will it really become you know, a medium of exchange and a store of value? Sam, you don't really want to ask me anything about Bitcoin. I mean, you know, when, when, when Bitcoin spiked um, a few years ago, uh, I think I was on, um, you know, uh, one of the cable channels and I said, you know, this is, this is a bubble that dwarfs anything we saw during um, uh, dot com and, uh, you know, that uh, left me open to being attacked by, you know, a lot of the Bitcoin advocates and, and the fact that, you know, the, the bubble did burst immediately after I said that gave me some credibility, but I had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I look at charts and, you know, anytime you know, line goes straight up and the Bitcoin line was going straight up uh, at the end of, um, what was it, 2018? Was that when it spiked? Uh, um, I believe so. I, th I think that it was. It was either 2017 or 2018. And, um, uh, and, and now, you know, I think what we've seen after that initial uh, shakeout is, you know, a more serious effort to uh, think about sort of the blockchain technology uh, and the need to have some digital cashless connectivity, um, you know, within markets and in some cases across markets. Uh, and um, uh, whether or not, you know, that truly emerges uh, as a currency substitute, I think it's still highly debatable. But, um, you know, the move that Elon Musk made is, is certainly interesting. And the price point of Bitcoin now, I, I don't know, where is it, 40,000? Who knows? Um, it's, uh, it's gone up from 40,000 like a week ago, I think, to uh, yesterday hit 47,000 uh, per coin. It was up 20% just after Elon Musk announced the, the purchase like two days ago. Yeah, uh, you, you got to, you know, you, you got to <laughs> look at this thing, you know, almost every second to know where the price points are. But, but it's, um, you know, the, the guy who's, I think, the, the most serious apostle of blockchain, uh, 
is an investor, uh, Mike Novogratz, who I've had you know huge respect for for a long time. He's a great macro thinker, and of course, you know he's a uh, um, you know a big believer that 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 Bitcoin has nothing but upside for the foreseeable future. But even Mike would be the first to tell you that. Uh, the lines that go up vertically in markets don't um, uh, stay that course on a long-term basis. And I, I'm certain he would admit that, you know, uh, significant corrections are likely along the way. I think uh, Mike Novogratz came to Princeton to speak about Bitcoin. I think when I was a, a freshman or sophomore, like two, three years ago, I went to his talk and I came away from that talk thinking that there was no way this is going to happen. I mean, Bitcoin. So, and and I think uh, subsequently at Policy Punchdown, we interviewed some political theorists of money, other economists. Uh, it seems that every academic I've talked to, or or any serious uh, established business executives, were all extremely skeptical of this vision put forth by the Bitcoin community because they give all kinds of reasons of. Uh, why it doesn't actually change the power structure. It has all kinds of problems with governance. It has its own technological issues, such and so on. But I think what we've witnessed is just that it just kept going up because the, I guess my, my question would be, I am not entirely convinced or at all convinced that, that Bitcoin would be the new political vision that would solve our world's problems. But I'm very convinced that the speculative bubble is strong enough to keep the party going. So, so in, in other words, it, I, I, it seems that the markets have been more detached from fundamentals. And Bit, the nice thing about Bitcoin is that it has no fundamentals. You don't need fundamentals. You just need, it's a currency, so you just need people's faith in it. And as long as the faith for this currency is strong enough, as long as people's doubts on doubt dollar on other forms of assets are strong enough, as long as the hunt for yield continues, this thing will just keep sh shooting up, right? So uh, th that, that is my take. I don't know if you agree with that, Professor Roach. Well, Tiger, I would say, I don't want to sound too <laughs> professorial here, but um, um, speculative bubble is a word you just used. And you said, well, it will go on forever. By definition, speculative bubbles do not go on forever. They always burst, always. Um, a, you know, an asset, when it, be, when it turns into a speculative bubble, that means that people are buying the asset just under the expectation that the prices will keep going up. And so by definition, um, it's an investor play on price appreciation that is detached from the fundamental value of the asset. And so that detachment we know uh, can go on for a lot longer than we think. But ultimately, it reasserts itself when uh, you know the price point, uh, for reasons that are very different for each each asset uh, uh, involved, uh, gets so far detached that just the slightest inconsequential uh, uh, shift uh, can uh, lead to the bursting of the bubble. And you know, you could conjure up all sorts of you know wild things, you know, regulatory uh, pressures. Uh, Elon Musk could change his mind, which he's done uh, sort of on a weekly basis for most of his career. Um, <laughs> or somebody else could you know, raise some, some questions about uh, the underlying technology. I have no idea, but you know, I'm suspicious of this very notion that a speculative bubble can go on forever because to me, by definition, they never do. Uh, one uh, common phrase used by people in the Bitcoin community is Bitcoin to the moon. Uh, the, the Winklevoss twins are a big component of Bitcoin and they say it's going to be half a million dollar per coin. You know, the, the sky's the limit in, in some way. And uh, I think the way well, they, they also look... claim they invented Facebook too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I guess my, my question on that, so you, you were talking about how things are getting more detached from fundamentals and obviously for Bitcoin, there's no fundamentals. But my, my first question would be, what do you think of something like gold, uh, which is also has a lot of the similar properties as, as a commodity money, sort of uh, in the sense it's limited in supply. We, we've come together to recognize there's some kind of intrinsic value, but you can't eat gold. Gold doesn't really do anything. It is some kind of a store of value or medium of exchange. 
because humans have collectively bought into this narrative that gold is the is the measurement we use. Uh, why won't that happen for a digital currency or cryptocurrency like Bitcoin? So, so I, I, I'm trying to understand what, what you mean by fundamentals, because for, for companies, we know there are cash flows that we can discount uh, for, for the stock markets. We can kind of look at P ratios or something. But before an asset for currency, uh, what are the fundamentals? Well, um, first of all, you know, what is the definition of a currency? Uh, currency is something you can, you know, you can hold. It's, it can, uh, it can be a store of value, and it's widely accepted um, uh, as a medium of transactions. Uh, does Bitcoin, you know, qualify on on any of those counts? I mean, it's 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 hard to uh, really label Bitcoin as as a currency. Uh, it could certainly be labeled as a, a financial asset or a, if it grows big enough and is an asset class. But I think it's a real misnomer to uh, call it a, a, a currency. Uh, I think it's interesting that Bitcoin's um, uh, sort of uh, attraction has taken off uh, during a period when some, uh, myself obviously included, uh, are beginning to question the stability and role of, of the dollar. And so with you know, the world's currency under some surprising downward pressure and a case being made as I just made it to you that there could be more to come, uh, you know, financial markets are you know, possibly in search for uh, a, a new anchor. Can, can a, you know, a, a sort of blockchain technology be that new answer? It's possible, uh, but it's probably pretty early to reach that conclusion. And especially an asset whose price point has been is extraordinarily volatile uh, as Bitcoins has um, you know, over the last you know, three or four years. So gold historically has been the, you know, the anchor of the financial system. It's definitely a store of value. It has been used uh, as a means of exchange in the past, no longer, but it still uh, plays a linchpin role in anchoring um, uh, sort of a lot of, um, of, of financial assets uh, ar around the world. Uh, and it, you know, it's something tangible that you can hold and look at and feel as opposed to you know, a bunch of you know, zeros and ones in a supercomputer. I, I see what you're saying. Um, but, but perhaps it might be uh, good for investors to, to own a little bit of gold or Bitcoin on the side, if, if we were to expect this 35% dollar crash. Uh, in, in some well, sense. look, I, you know, to me, precious metals have been a hedge uh, historically against inflation, but you could also make a point uh, that they would be a hedge against uh, deflation. So again, I go back to the discussion we had earlier. Um, if you're looking for big shifts uh, in inflation one way or another, you know, then the, the alternative of a precious metal that has uh, a more predictable and stable store of value, um, that becomes more attractive. But Professor Roger, I think um, a, a good uh, point to, to pivot towards uh, right after this discussion about Bitcoin is that another huge piece of market news these days, uh, which is GameStop and the rise of Reddit traders, Wall Street bets. I, I don't know if, if, if you still follow the, the uh, fracas or noises in the financial markets these days, but there's just been so much stuff being discussed these days, what the long-term implications may be, uh, people's dissatisfaction towards Wall Street establishment, uh, is, this, uh, is the rise of retail trading, uh, will, will that kill the entire short uh, selling business down the road, and, and so on. So I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on this, because from Bitcoin to the rise of retail traders to this whole you know, Wall Street bed revolution that we're seeing or whatever, it just seems that the market is just getting more volatile. It's, it's more... Uh, detached from quote unquote fundamentals, it's getting more technical. Uh, it, it's really hard to get a pulse of where markets is going next. Uh, be, and, and people say that uh, because they are supported by the faith that the Federal Reserve is there for you no matter what, and they're going to bail out the markets no matter what, and the markets will go up to the moon no matter what. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on those matters. 
Well, I've watched from afar, Tiger, this um, uh, sort of uh, new democratization of, uh, you know, Reddit-based retailers in, into seemingly uh, uh, depressed valuations in stocks like uh, GameStop. And, um, you know, that has been um, pretty much depicted as uh, a populist uprising against uh, hedge funds and short selling. And, you know, for, for at least one trade, one cycle, it seems to have worked and gotten, you know, an awful lot of attention. Is this the new norm? Uh, is it we're likely to see more of this? Um, I doubt it because I think that um, not, not that uh, the concentration of investor power in institutional investors or alternatives such as hedge funds or the specialists uh, such as short sellers is likely to be, um, you know, an enduring aspect of the Wall Street power structure. I just think that, you know, over time, uh, their ability to uh, discern valuation opportunities, both on the long side and the short side, is, is really superior to the sort of the gang warfare of, you know, the retail um, crowd that, you know, gets um, uh, motivated uh, through these, you know, Reddit type uh, bulletin boards. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it worked, it worked once. Does that, you know, I hesitate to, as a, you know, uh, a, uh, a retired forecaster, I always he hesitate to forecast a trend based on one observation, but I, I, I would be very surprised to see this as a new and lasting mega trend, uh, in, um, uh, uh, the investment business. And one of the things that, you know, was so interesting about you know, the GameStop short squeeze is that you know, the Redditors, the, the Robin and traders were, you know, they thought of themselves as, you know, fighting against the man, against the establishment. And um, in, a, in a recent column that I read by Bill Dudley, he wrote that the composition and prices of financial assets uh, held by the private sector change as a consequence of the Fed's, you know, rapid balance sheet expansion, which we've you know, obviously seen a lot of in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and, and I think one thing that, that maybe a lot of Americans have thought is that, you know, as these assets increase in price, the people benefiting from the capital gains aren't regular people. They're, you know, the wealthiest people in America. I think only, only about 50% of, of Americans own stocks. Do you think that, um, maybe there are more equitable ways of stimulating the economy other than uh, affecting, you know, financial assets, buying corporate bonds, you know, propping up markets? Yeah, that's a great question, Sam. I mean, I, you know, back in the day, I used to actually um, debate Bill Dudley about this when, um, you know, we were both the <clears throat> head economists of two competing uh, Wall Street firms. Um, you know, what you're talking about has now been described um, in this COVID era as the K-shaped recovery, where the upper leg is, you know, the top 5% of the, uh, the income or wealth distribution, maybe some would say the top 1%, and the lower leg is, you know, a lot more prominent with the rest of the, uh, the populace, certainly uh, not sharing in, in the benefits of um, uh, this asset uh, appreciation. And, you know, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, you know, that when you have um, an economy that is weak and gets hit by a series of crises uh, and the first line of defense repeatedly, crisis after crisis, uh, is the central bank, and in our case, the Fed, uh, and when they suppress interest rates the way they have since the, um, basically since the bursting of the dot-com bubble in 2000. So it's been 20 years 
of unusually accommodative uh, uh, monetary policy. Uh, and then um, uh, moving to uh, asset purchases, quantitative easing, balance sheet expansion that far exceeds the expansion of the nominal GDP. So injecting excess liquidity into the markets, uh, you have a central bank that uh, is, is really become the enabler of the K-shaped recovery. So I find it interesting that my good friend, Bill Dudley uh, writes and bemoans um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the inequality implications uh, of um, this current financial market environment. But as a senior Fed official, he was uh, you know, present uh, at the, uh, the creation of the monster. Uh, Professor Roach, you're no longer debating with Professor Dudley uh, in the same room, but, uh, but across podcasting uh, through Policy Punchline now. This is the amazing wonder of technological innovation of podcasting, I suppose. Uh, well, that's great. But anyway, <laughs> You know, not to personalize this with yeah. respect to Bill, but the central bank, um, especially in this, uh, you know, this last 20 years or so, our Federal Reserve uh, has very much favored providing um, uh, extraordinary support uh, for asset dependent economic growth. And so, you know, it started with Greenspan. Uh, where he uh, worried about um, uh, irrational exuberance in December of 1996 and said very clearly that um, how do we know when we have not, you know, our markets have not become irrationally exuberant like those in Japan. And this was 1996, uh, you know, four years, five years after the bursting of the Japanese equity bubble. How do we know when, you know, it hasn't happened uh, here and he said very clearly in you know, in those few sentences where he shocked the world by saying this uh, that we must be mindful of the risks of um, of um, uh, at the interplay between asset markets and the real economy uh, and we must study the complexity of that relationship and their bearing on monetary policy very seriously. And so he, he laid it all out and then he, he forgot what he said and he went on to become the apostle of the asset dependent US economy that uh, uh, Bernanke then uh, picked up on and, uh, and left uh, you know, Janet Yellen and Jay Powell with um, you know, uh, a, a tough, um, set of conditions to, um, to pull out of. Uh, and, you know, as long as we're running um, uh, monetary policy uh, with uh, zero policy rates uh, and balance sheets as large as they are in the US, our asset markets are gonna still be a critically important role in underpinning our real economy. And that ultimately worries me down the road. Uh, Professor Roach, I think this is getting to the, the most exciting part of this, this interview, which is we're trying to piece together those large macro financial trends. And, and you mentioned the great moderation would, or otherwise the, be called the, the Greenspan put, his kind of naive way of looking at market liberalism or this libertarian view of just let the stock market do everything. And if anything happens, uh, the, the Fed supports it. The Fed supports liquidity and, and, and boosts things up. But do you think it is because that starting in those days, America was starting to struggle with growth? Uh, in, in, in other words, we could not have fundamentally supported growth. So we could only have growth through low interest environments, through greater access to liquidity, through asset price inflation, so that the American people can still feel like the country is growing. And, and that is the dramatic rise of financialization of the economy that, that we have today. And very unfortunately, 2008 happened. And, and back then, I think Bernanke's justification was saying uh, the Congress is paralyzed and nobody can do anything. So the Federal Reserve has to step in and, and do quantitative easing, which is very similar. The same argument I think we're seeing today from Chair Powell, which is we have to support market function and 
we are not seeing as much uh, fiscal policy. Uh, and, and it seems that we cannot get out of this environment that is low interest rate, high QE, tons of money printing, inflation of asset prices. And this is the only way that American people can feel like things are growing. Um, Tiger, you hit the nail on the head with the first part of your um, comment there. And that was that the US was struggling with growth the old fashioned way. I'd call that income-based growth where uh, consumers and businesses spent on the basis of what they earned from current production. And so, you know, we needed a new way to boost our growth rate. Uh, and, and Greenspan, I think, discovered that uh, by, uh, you know, you call it the Greenspan put, but by recognizing the linkage that we could get uh, between asset appreciation uh, and economic growth. All we needed uh, were a series of instruments to enable us to extract purchasing power from asset appreciation. Uh, and we did that uh, in the um, early 2000s by you know, the complexity of um, uh, uh, derivatives, structured products, uh, and in particular, uh, home equity loans that enabled you to lever uh, your biggest asset, uh, your, your investment in residential property, but the problem with that uh, sort of levered uh, asset appreciation play was that the collateral turned into a bubble. And so when the housing bubble burst and consumers had been gotten accustomed uh, to spending on the basis of um, equity extraction uh, from a bubble, they were uh, in a huge overly indebted position that triggered precisely what Greenspan warned of uh, in 1996, a massive balance sheet recession uh, that uh, really clobbered American consumption uh, in the um, uh, uh, 08 and 09 period in a way that we've never seen before. So again, just going back to the way I look at things like currencies, there were consequences of the asset dependent economy that we were in denial over uh, until uh, the bubble that was underpinning uh, this um, uh, uh, the collateral that was driving uh, asset dependent consumption to excess burst. Uh, and then you know, we paid uh, a long price uh, for a long time. And you're right, we're still paying that price because we, we haven't figured out a way to get out of this trap of um, uh, interest rates uh, at the you know the, the lower zero bound uh, and uh, this massive overhang of central bank balance sheets, the Fed uh, may you know may be on to something by saying okay, uh, let's do average inflation targeting, which would be more forgiving uh, of. Um, uh, overshoots inflation because they they want more inflation uh, than um, uh, we've been uh, uh, seeing for a long time. And the subtext of that is, uh, if we get uh, more inflation for an average tar uh, inflation targeting Fed, that means the yield curve will steepen, the long rates will move up uh, more quickly than the short rates, and that will have an adverse impact on competing assets uh, like equities and maybe draw this uh, asset dependent spending binge uh, into some question. But that's, you know, way out there, not anything over the near term. So, so Professor Roach, what would be the solution to all this? It, it, I, get, I keep getting very pessimistic views uh, from, from or, or takeaways from our guests, because I, I remember asking Professor Dudley about this, you know, uh, is the way we look at is the way we conduct monetary policy somewhat flawed or broken because inflation does not seem to be governed by the traditional levers of monetary policy anymore. It seems that we cannot get out of the, this global liquidity trap of low interest rate. It seems that we cannot exit QE very quickly. 
uh, what are the next steps? It seems that monetary policy is really out of tools. Well, I think, you know, the, you know, the, the most important steps I think are to not think about monetary policy as an end in and of itself, but a means toward that end and go back to what, you know, the mandate of the central bank in this country is, which is aimed at uh, full employment and price stability. And I would add, you know, a third, which has sort of become now an implicit um, uh, uh, sort of stool to the Fed's mandate and that's financial stability. Um, to the extent that we can set monetary policy with those goals in hand, um, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully find a, uh, you know, a better resolution toward solving uh, the economic growth uh, equation than we have been doing. I think the, uh, the way to, uh, to grow an economy over the longer haul, getting back to the point I opened up with, is to foster policies, both fiscal and monetary, that provide greater uh, domestic saving, that, that put our, the funding of our economy on a, on a more solid long-term basis. If we save more uh, at home, um, we'll be less reliant on foreign saving uh, to fill the void, we'll have fewer uh, trade deficits or the trade deficits in general uh, will diminish. That'll bring jobs and income back home uh, and more saving, not immediately because of the problems you mentioned about the weak economy, but over the medium to long term, more saving will give us the wherewithal to invest in the future, rebuilding our, uh, our infrastructure, rebuilding our uh, manufacturing capacity, um, uh, investing in uh, educational reform and uh, R&D spending and innovation. There's so many things that we uh, have let slide uh, uh, in um, uh, dealing with our growth challenges that we're unable to accomplish as a saving short uh, uh, nation. And so I think um, we need to think about both fiscal and monetary policy much more so in that context than in this uh, short-term context of you know what can, what's the latest thing we can do when we're out of basis points and we have an excess uh, uh, overhang in the balance sheet uh, to support our financial system. There's got to be a, a better way to design uh, policy strategy than that. There's one more idea I wanted to ask you about. Well, we're still on the topic of monetary policy. Now, it, one big potential threat to the current stock market boom is that if there's a swift e economic recovery, uh, the Fed, the first thing the Fed might do wouldn't be to raise rates, but to slow its quantitative easing, uh, like it did, for example, in 2013. Um, when when it, in 2013, the Fed communicated that they would slow down their purchases of treasuries, there was a resulting 140 basis point drop in the 10-year rates. Um, this was you know, the so-called taper tantrum, where rates normalized simply because the Fed stopped being extremely dovish. Uh, do you think, like, or I guess there is kind of a fear that we, get, we could have something else like this in 2021, you know, once the Fed begins to signal that they will slow the current, um, the current purchases of treasuries? Uh, I just wanted to ask if you agree with something like this. Well, not for 2021. I think that's premature, Sam, but I think the point you're making is a really important one. We have become conditioned uh, to a central bank that, you know, through, you know, the, the technical jargon is forward guidance, uh, has convinced um, markets and the broad constellation of investors that um, zero interest rates uh, and large balance sheets are here to stay for a lot longer than any of us uh, had thought. And you know, if and when the central bank sends a signal that draws that, those presumptions uh, into question uh, at a time when the markets are um, uh, priced for the opposite, then, then there will, by definition, be a large correction uh, in the markets. And so the Fed, mindful of the lessons of the taper tantrum, as you point out, will want to be very judicious 
uh, in sending a signal uh, like that again. And, and having learned from the taper tantrum, uh, uh, I think they will be um, uh, far more judicious in sending that uh, message the next time they think it is uh, appropriate. And they will provide plenty of warning uh, for markets and investors to begin a very gradual process of um, resetting uh, expectations. Uh, the risk is that you know the world doesn't work as smoothly as that, and they may have to move sooner, uh, and they may have to move uh, more rapidly than this um, uh, benign adjustment path might allow for. Uh, Professor Roach, I, I, um, one quick thing to follow up. Uh, would be the idea of forecasting uh, because uh, that's kind of what we're talking about, forward guidance, uh, how the Federal Reserve has forecasted things and how market participants react to that. Uh, I, I'm taking this macro finance class under Professor Atif Mian, who you may, um, may know as one of the, uh, the greatest uh, financial economists of our age. And he gave this story uh, when the Queen of England asked the room of economists, why did nobody notice it, referring to the 2000 financial crisis? And I think there is some truth to it, he's saying, because for many years, we have not been able to predict the decline of uh, our star, the decline of interest rate, the, 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 the dramatic buildup of, of uh, quantitative easing. There's been systematic forecasting errors on interest rates. And it's one directional, which is that we overestimate how interest rates will go, how high interest rates will go. And we end up seeing interest rates falling much, much further. And likewise, with, with the efficacy of quantitative easing, I, I think there was a study uh, during the summer that said uh, central bankers have the tendency to overestimate the, the efficacy of quantitative easing and, and so on. So it seems that there are some inherent biases, both for central bankers who do those policies themselves and for market participants, uh, uh, hedge fund managers or, or uh, sell side research uh, analysts. It, it seems that everybody have their own kind of uh, mental limitations or cognitive dissonances that are preventing us from getting somewhere, I guess this is a little bit more of a philosophical question, but um, do you really uh, have faith that, that we'll be able to, to pull ourselves out of this and, and be able to predict things correctly in, in the medium to long run? Well, Tiger, I mean, I take your question seriously and I take it personally. I, I'm a recovering Wall Street forecaster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I had a long career as a forecaster um, at the Federal Reserve Board uh, in the 1970s. I, together with one of my colleagues, um, we built the, the Fed's um, uh, black box that is still in use today to do the official forecasts for the uh, FOMC. Um, and, um, you know, I did a lot of forecasting in my Morgan Stanley days. Um, you know, I take the old line, um, it was Yogi Berra took credit for it, but it was actually Niels Bohr, the physicist who said it, that uh, forecasting is especially difficult if it involves the future. Uh, and, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's very difficult to do. And so my approach has always been uh, one, with, you know, I, I recognize that markets want uh, economists and central bankers uh, to make forecasts, but there's so many things that can um, uh, come up unexpectedly that will affect outcomes. Um, the best way to approach the, uh, the forecast, I think, is just to have a framework that describes the way you think the world works and, what, and be very clear and rigorous in uh, conveying the assumptions that you make uh, to construct that view of the world and then draw some conclusions on the basis of that construct of the world that will have impacts on things like uh, inflation and fiscal and monetary policy and then make your market forecasts uh, as an outgrowth of that. And then when things happen that disturb your scenario or challenge your assumptions, you'll know how to make the adjustments to your forecasts. The forecasters they get into so much trouble are the ones that just sort of, you know, stick their finger in the air and they make a call and they're brilliant uh, for one month and then they never get anything right again because they, they don't really have a framework. And, um, you know, the sort of the rigor of a framework 
the analytics of um, the, the macro analytics of a disciplined approach to understanding the interplay between financial markets and the real economy. And I think those are absolutely essential uh, for successful forecasting uh, with, for central banks, um, for um, Wall Street firms and, and for uh, other types of um, uh, interested parties like institutional investors uh, and hedge funds. Uh, Professor Roach, my, my last question on this t topic, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I've been reading uh, George Soros' book, The Alchemy of Finance, and he brings up this crucial concept, reflexivity, which is that the, the market is not determined by the fundamentals or the facts per se, it's, but by our understanding of it, our perception of it, our reaction towards them, uh, there are sec second order consequences and effects. Um, I, I suppose that is somewhat similar to your forecasting philosophy we're looking at the, the way of the world which is that it's a very complex system that you can't really predict per se but but there are different ways you can you can map out the different levels of impact uh, in some sense well you know george soros who i've known for a number of years is you know just a brilliant very successful investor and um you know not only does he you know, have insights into financial markets, but, you know, he's been a real activist in trying to change the world. And I give him enormous credit for that. Um, uh, I never truly understood his concept of reflexivity. Uh, uh, you know, I think the, the book, um, you know, had a lot to say about the interplay between uh, investor positioning and economic um, uh, results that would be influenced by uh, the bets that investors made. But, um, you know, and just leave it at that. It, it, it's a complex world. And if you have a framework that gives you a window into some aspect of that complexity, then uh, you're ahead of the game. Yeah, well, I, I, but, you know, before we wrap up, I wanted to pivot a little bit back toward your China-U.S. relations. I, we'd really just love to hear your thoughts on you know, where you see it going, whether you think the Biden administration can kind of tamper you know, the tensions and improve the situation for both countries? Well, it's a big subject, Sam. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrote a book on it um, about five years ago that I think, uh, again, you know, laid out a framework to think about uh, a relationship that was in conflict. Uh, and I looked at um, the US China as being in a codependent economic relationship where both nations depend on one another. But if one um, uh, partner uh, changes the rules of the game, uh, the other one feels um, uh, like um, it's been left out and could lash back. Uh, and uh, a conflict would arise, and, and that's pretty much what happened. And I'm now in the early stages of writing a, a sequel on uh, how to resolve it. Um, it's, it's going to be challenging uh, to find an easy way out of this uh, conflict. I, I would say that um, there's one issue that uh, unites uh, Democrats, Republicans, uh, educated, uneducated, uh, old or young. It's America's uh, unfortunate uh, negative sentiment toward China as being the source of all evil, inflicting uh, damage on the U.S. economy, its workers, its communities, and ultimately uh, an existential threat to our future prosperity, if you believe uh, all of the saber rattling that's occurred with respect to uh, China's um, uh, aspirations to be dominant in uh, leading technologies through surreptitious means um, within a short period of time. Um, you know, I think you know, the rhetoric has gone well beyond uh, reality. The relationship uh, has been um, damaged by a growing profusion of false narratives coming from our side, but also 
uh, false narratives that have um, uh, been evident on the Chinese side where we're really mischaracterizing uh, both intent uh, and causality for uh, economic issues uh, in, in both systems. So the Biden administration has an opportunity to uh, enter into this conflict and hopefully <coughs> Um, provide a, a more constructive framework of uh, engagement. And so I've, I've written a series of articles about this um, over the last few years. And, and just to give you the, uh, the real sort of skinny version, um, there are sort of two aspects of conflict resolution that I think are important to think about. One, just getting back into conversation with the Chinese. And, and there we've got a lot of low-hanging fruit, fruit that we have mutual interest in engaging on. Um, things like uh, climate change and uh, global health in this uh, COVID era. And the US by um, recommitting to join, um, rejoin uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the World Health Organization uh, is, is opening up uh, the opportunity for some more meaningful high level exchanges with China and that's good. Uh, but we need to do more than pick low hanging fruit. We need a new framework uh, of engagement. Uh, and there I would focus on three things, trade, um, structural issues like uh, technology and innovation, uh, forced technology transfer and the like. And then the structure of um, uh, of, of the way in which we conduct dialogues. And briefly on trade, I have recommended and written um, that we um, uh, abandon this so-called phase one trade deal that was cut by uh, Trump um, a year ago. It failed, uh, it caused damage to American workers in manufacturing uh, and it will never work. Uh, and the tariffs that underpin it uh, have been a negative for U.S. companies and for U.S. consumers. Uh, and it goes, you know, not surprisingly for me, uh, the trade issues go back uh, to the savings and balances that we, we spoke of earlier. Uh, we have a multilateral trade problem, deficits with 102 countries last year. You can't fix that uh, by focusing on the bilateral imbalance with China. You really have to address uh, the saving uh, issue, which um, you know we're we're not doing over the near term. The second point is um, uh, move away from bilateral trade to the structural technology innovation, um, technology transfer, cyber, um, uh, subsidies of state-owned enterprises. Do that under the context of a big agreement uh, that we were close to in the Obama administration, a bilateral investment treaty, which aims at uh, uh, increasing market access uh, for us into Chinese markets and China into our markets, but by uh, under the conditions that these structural issues are managed to um, uh, our mutual satisfaction. And thirdly, the dialogue, um, you know, our dialogue with China has been um, uh, really, I think, an exercise in event planning. You know, in the uh, uh, Bush two administration, we did these twice yearly summits, the, the strategic economic dialogue. Under Obama, they were done once a year, strategic and economic dialogue. You know, Trump did it through, you know, dinner parties at Mar-a-Lago. I mean, our relationship has been very poorly managed. So we need a full-time office. I've called it a secretariat uh, located in a neutral territory staffed by senior uh, advisors in both nations who build joint databases, that develop joint policy white papers, who focus on uh, ongoing policy deliberations, um, uh, execution and implementation uh, and dispute adjudication. Uh, and the secretariat can um, uh, be um, uh, a much more effective way uh, 
So that's my simple um, um, uh, prescription for solving the most complex uh, bilateral conflict in the world today. If I told you more, though, you wouldn't buy the next book. So I'll just have to leave it at that. Uh, by, by the time your next book comes out, I would love to, uh, if possible, have you back on the show to talk about it. If, 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 um, but, but yeah, I, we've already taken too much of your time, Professor Roach. I, I think uh, it would be nice to gradually wrap it up. And one of my questions that I always ask uh, our guests is whether they're optimistic or pessimistic about the outlook where, where this country is headed, where the economy is headed, where markets are headed. Are, are you optimistic? Well, you know, you have to be optimistic um, after the year that we've been through, Tiger. Uh, and really? <laughs> um, a disease as frightening and as unpredictable as COVID-19 and to watch uh, the scientific community uh, when given the support that you know they need to respond to this with you know extraordinary uh, breakthroughs um, in terms of uh, therapeutics and of course uh, vaccines and you know as the disease um, starts to take on sort of some of these predictable uh, mutations and uh, and other forms and certainly raises the possibility that um, you know we'll be dealing with some aspect of um, uh, COVID long after the, uh, uh, you know, the worst is, is over. It just underscores, uh, I think, the, the important role that science can play in setting, um, uh, you know, laying the foundation uh, for uh, economic security and uh, prosperity. So I'm, I'm you know, I take this experience as a really uh, important uh, signal of um, uh, optimism for uh, the future. But I go back to the, the basic uh, point that I hope I've conveyed throughout this discussion is that uh, we can be optimistic on what science has accomplished, but <clears throat> we, we can't necessarily presume that that's the way it's gonna be in the future if we don't have the wherewithal uh, to support uh, future scientific uh, uh, endeavors and um, uh, you know, rebuild our country. Uh, politicians say build it back better. I mean, all of this rebuilding, whether it's a physical capital or human capital is not costless. Uh, and it can only occur if we begin to think more seriously about the long-term imperatives of a foundation uh, of saving. Uh, and uh, we've gotten away with without much saving for a long, long time. That is not a sustainable recipe uh, for an enduring prosperity. And so, you know, as we try to dig ourselves out of yet another crisis, another deep hole, I think we need to be more longer term in our time horizon, our economic strategy, and then uh, you know, taking our cue from the examples of what the scientific community has accomplished in addressing COVID. Just imagine what we could do if we had you know, a more solid base on which to look for the future in terms of uh, domestic savings. And I'm hopeful that, uh, that you know, this uh, tough period that we've been through over the last couple of decades is a wake-up call in that regard. And then I'll be extremely optimistic uh, for a, a much longer period of time. Uh, so since the name of our show is Policy Punchline, at the end, I also have to ask you, what would your punchline be? We, we started off by talking about uh, the exorbitant uh, privileges of dollar. We talked about uh, monetary policy, the markets, GameStop and, and Bitcoin. Uh, U.S.-China relations. What would your your punchline be uh, for for all this, or one of them? Well, I think um, you actually you know alluded to it in one of your uh, uh, questions, sort of midway through this, and that is for um, policymakers, uh, fiscal, but especially monetary policymakers who think 
strategically about um, uh, the choices they face uh, to put, put much greater weight on the so-called exit strategy uh, and the path to normalization. Recognizing that um, uh, it is going to be utterly impossible to sustain a monetary policy at zero interest rates uh, and um, enormous balance sheets in perpetuity. And so if you buy that, then you understand that uh, you need to really invest a lot of time in thinking about uh, number one, what a more normal configuration of interest rates and balance sheets would be, and then how to get there. And um, you know, the, the Fed, to its credit, had laid out with some transparency um, uh, some rules of balance sheet normalization uh, and began to act on it. And then, you know, bad things happened and, you know, that's all been put aside. Uh, but um, that's where the, the heavy lifting needs that to occur. Uh, Professor Roche, it's just been a wonderful conversation. I think uh, our listeners must have enjoyed it. I, how can they follow your work? You mentioned you have an upcoming book. Are you on Twitter? Uh, uh, how, how, how else can people follow? I don't tweet. Um, I do write a, a, a monthly piece for Project Syndicate, which you can find on the Project Syndicate website, which you know I urge your, um, your viewers, your listeners, your friends to follow on a regular basis. I mean, Project Syndicate has probably a couple of hundred of the deepest thinkers in the world engaged in active uh, debates through relatively short readable pieces um, uh, every month that are then get uh, pushed um, as the name might suggest on a syndicated basis into newspapers and magazines all over the world. And then I write occasionally for other, you know, mundane outlets like, um, you know, Bloomberg or the Financial <laughs> Times. <laughs> Uh, yes. places like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Roach, thank you so much for, for joining Sammy today. It's just been such a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Tiger. Thank you, Sam. Sam, thanks so much for, for being here with me, co-hosting the show as always. Yeah, as always, Tiger. Thank you. Uh, well, this concludes this episode of Policy Punchline. That was with uh, Stephen Roach, who is a senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs. He was previously uh, Morgan Stanley's uh, firm's chief economist and then uh, uh, chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. Uh, we talked about a uh, dollar crash or, or uh, maybe not crash and, and Bitcoin's rise and fall and uh, monetary policy. Uh, you may watch the full video on uh, policypunchline.com or our YouTube ch channel. Uh, please follow us and thank you so much for listening today. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.